welcome to Streaming Into the Void, where we discuss all the streaming news for the week ending July 12th, 2024. I'm Kim Hollis, who intends to win this year's Home Run Derby. Raul, will play my music. With me are Tim Brighty, content creator and gamer, and hearing rumors he may be killed off in today's season finale. Wow, I can't believe we're at the end of our fourth season. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Also, David Mumpower, author of Behind the Ride and streaming media analyst, who is ready to discuss the biggest streaming story in the history of the podcast. But as Madison would say, it's not what you think. <laughs> and the podcast is produced and edited by Raul Burial, who wants to get on with it. It's GoFest, and Pikachu is wearing a crown. <laughs> God, we better hurry then. When you say get on with it, do you mean killing Tim off? That too. <laughs> no comment. It's the season finale of Streaming Into the Void. Can we have a drum roll as the universe kindly gives us storylines that are tying up this week? Folks, let's have a bit of pageantry. Our podcast ends its fourth season this week, which means the start of the pandemic was a long time ago. Since the beginning, we've been saying streaming service consolidation seemed inevitable as people weren't likely to purchase seven or eight monthly subscriptions. Well, it took the industry this long and losses in the tens of billions of dollars for everyone to accept that reality. Now we're playing Corporate Survivor, and Sherry Redstone was just voted off the island, but she did get to attend Summer Camp for Billionaires one last time. Yes, in the long-running saga of who's going to buy Paramount, it looks like we're finally, finally going to be put out of our misery. Or are we? Oh, we have a winner. Is, is that the right term? Winner? As Paramount's board and Sherry Redstone, who controls the company, both signed off on merging Paramount with David Ellison's Skydance Entertainment. Jeff Schell, who last year was kicked to the curb as chief executive at NBC Universal when it was revealed he'd been having an affair with a subordinate, will be the new president of the company once the complicated transaction is concluded. <clears throat> affair with a subordinate is a very polite way of saying fired for sexual harassment. That's the person they're picking to lead the new company. Lawyers and HR people, start your engines. I'm sure he's promised not to do it again. But wait, it's not over yet. Paramount now has a 45-day go shop window during which they can shop around for a better offer. This is the bad place. <laughs> <laughs> Although Paramount will have to pay a $400 million breakup fee to Ellison if they back out. And Sherry Redstone has gone to, as David pointed out, Allen & Company's annual Sun Valley Conference, the so-called Summer Camp for Billionaires, where she will actively be soliciting competing bids. And in fact, David Zaslov is also at the Sun Valley Conference, presumably also trying to sell his company. This is all real, folks. We are not organizing the universe to make the storylines tie together like this. It's just happening. And it's going so well that Sony has already said, nope, we're out. Thanks anyway. Everyone is over this. I'm not saying it's a functional impossibility that somebody else bids, but in my mind, the game is over. David Ellison is about to lead the former Paramount, and I hope it goes about as well as the third act of his sister's film, Phantom Thread. But I'm worried it'll be more like the third act of the other movie she did, Her. Either way, I'm confident that the behind-the-scenes drama will be like Spring Breakers because freaking Comcast, the perennial winner of worst company in the world, just fired the new head of Paramount for cause. Now that is how you do a season finale, folks. Meet the new boss, <laughs> more criminal and incompetent than the old boss. The season five and six storylines write themselves. <laughs> <laughs> It should be noted that it's probably going to be several months before the transaction is concluded, and that's assuming that Redstone doesn't actually find herself another buyer. There's going to be some regulatory approval necessary because the purchase also includes CBS, a broadcast channel, which requires regulatory oversight. Now, Ellison has indicated that for the time being, the triumvirate of CEOs at Paramount will continue to do their job and hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, if they need to sell some stuff off 
before he assumes control. That's totally cool. The presumption is here they're probably going to sell off BET. Ellison has indicated that he's looking at $2 billion in cost savings once they've merged the two companies, and the price for selling BET is probably about $2 billion. Another asset that might be sold would be, sure, why not, CBS itself. If Paramount could spin off CBS or sell it to somebody else, like maybe, oh, I don't know, Warner Brothers Discovery, then Ellison wouldn't have to deal with that regulatory approval. Now, why would Warner Brothers Discovery be interested in buying CBS? Well, CBS, as it happens, has the rights to two things that Warner Brothers Discovery really wants. The other half of the March Madness contract and NFL broadcast rights. And why is that important to Warner Brothers Discovery? Oh, you're about to find out. Yeah, another season-long plotline that appears to be reaching a conclusion is the NBA's broadcast rights. The Athletic has details on the new agreement that will cover a broadcast of the National Basketball Association's games over the next 11 seasons. The NBA will get $76 billion <laughs> over 11 years from NBC, ABC, and ESPN, and Amazon Prime Video. The current agreement, which ends after the next season and lasted for nine years, cost ESPN and TNT Sports a combined $2.6 billion. The wild card here is that Warner Brothers Discovery, through their TNT Sports, will have a five-day window to make a counteroffer and hopefully get their rights back, but that's not going to happen. Best of all, we can start season five with Final confirmation on this one. Oh, wait. What's this note I'm getting from Tim? He has to record the podcast on Friday, which is before the five-day window ends. Mets fans are the absolute worst. I can't wait to kill you off. This is uh, this is why I'm being killed off, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not as convinced as Raul that this is a done deal because I feel like what Zaslav wants is to get paid off. And one of the ways he can get paid off is to just cause havoc here. And one of the ways he can cause havoc is to match because the NBA is going to want Amazon to stay involved. That is the X factor here that we don't know what the fallout would be. And since Zaslav is involved and we've been doing this for many years now, we know he will find a way to muck this up, even though it should be unmuckable. Well, you have to do the calculus here. Warner Bros. Discovery thought that they can get away with lowballing the NBA. In the end, what was a nine-year contract for $2.6 billion is now an 11-year contract for $76 billion. Warner Bros. Discovery cannot compete with that kind of money. Their bid, if they do put one in, is going to be for the package that Amazon has, and Amazon has deeper pockets than Warner Bros. Discovery. So if you are David Zaslov and you're looking to see how much it would cost you to get those NBA rights. And then you look over at Paramount and you wonder, how much would it cost me to buy CBS that's got NFL rights? You think maybe you have a better option here. Or if you're not worried about the debt, you like both options because the way you can match the Peacock side of this is by having your own ability to play network NBA games. That's what Comcast is offering right now that Warner Brothers Discovery can't match. There's all kinds of wrinkles in this, but the one that matters the most, at least from my perspective, is that Warner Brothers only wanted to pay $1.5 billion. The Amazon thing is $1.8 billion. Could they stretch another $300 million annually to keep that. I think that Raul is asking a really good question here about whether it makes more sense to invest that money to a dying linear network, but one that is still profitable right now. And CBS is, you know, the best one of those to have, let's be honest, versus the calculus of moving forward, keeping the thing you've always had and guaranteeing you're going to have it for a long time to come. That's an asset also. Debating the value of those assets is extraordinarily challenging. And since this is a streaming podcast, we probably favor the streaming one, don't we, Raul? Tying your wagon to uh, linear at this point, it's a very bad idea. Every studio in Hollywood that has linear channels is telling you how they're in decline, but they're still profitable. And so we're still going to count on them to make us a ton of money. This is one of the burdens that David Ellison at Skydance is going to have to assume once he takes over Paramount. He's got all of these linear channels that ultimately no one is watching. Is anyone watching VH1? Is anyone watching MTV? The fact of the matter is these are an albatross around the company. 
company, they need to be gone. They're going to be money losers sooner rather than later. Linear is not going to be around for that much longer. This NBA contract is for 11 years. And to expect that you're going to still have a viable, profitable, linear product in 11 years, honestly, in five years, is just very wishful thinking. It's all about what you're able to deliver on streaming. This is where we're going. And one of the little secrets in Hollywood right now is that Paramount Plus is about to break even and become profitable. This is why David Ellison is so invested in this company. I get that they still have these linear channels. I get that they have to get rid of them. But once they do, they will have on their hands the demonstrable product of what we've all been watching for years, the pivot from linear to streaming. Paramount Plus is going to demonstrate to everyone that eventually a studio can become profitable through streaming. And David Ellison wants to be at the top of that pile when it happens. So yeah, in the end, we are tying up a lot of loose ends. We are making jokes about season finales, but like any good season finale, as we tie up those loose ends, we are opening up entirely new plot lines. But uh, I guess that's the end for uh, loose ends, right, Kim? Oh, no, it's not, because we also have Redbox as their parent company, Chicken Soup for the Soul, has switched their Chapter 11 bankruptcy to Chapter 7. Uh, So we called it last week. Chapter 7 bankruptcy is liquidation. That means the company is done. They're going to be selling off all their assets. All Redbox kiosks are now shut down. Although I've got a picture from a Redbox kiosk from just yesterday that didn't know it was shut down. And all employees, about a thousand of them, are going to lose their jobs unless someone else buys the company and resurrects it. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of all this, at least as it relates to streaming, is the fact that the company also owns the streaming service Crackle, which they bought from Sony a few years back. Yeah, we're not in any way surprised by this. Good people are losing their jobs. They may not get paid back money they're owed. Even though the workers had their health care deducted from their paychecks, they're going to get billed the full amount for any medical treatment they received. That's going to be a multi-thousand dollar kick in the crotch on the way out because the corporation wasn't paying its bills. And that means that the health care is going to bill the patients instead. The leadership at Chicken Soup for the Soul felled their people. It's that simple. Now, as for the crackle part, which I find very interesting, somebody's probably going to stumble into a really good asset here. Some creditor is going to get crackle for pennies on the dollar. And that's an interesting side story to track, isn't it? It is a existing viable streaming service with an established subscriber base. You can go to crackle.com right now and watch content on it for free. It is ad supported. There is in fact some quote unquote original content. I was scrolling through it. I don't know that I would call any of it necessarily truly original, but it would be hard to find anywhere else. There is some French Canadian content of all things on it, which is unusual, but they have found a way to supplement their library with content that you can't find necessarily in other places. As liquidation proceeds, what can be sold off will, and the creditors will get cash. What can't be sold off will be handed off to creditors. And it may well be that, I don't know, a venture capital firm or some other banker is going to end up owning Crackle. And then it's a question of what they do with it. It's uh, going to be interesting to uh, watch this one for a while. All right, Tim, do we have any box office to talk about this week? No, no, no. Before we do box office, we're going to cover the biggest streaming story of the week. What is wrong with you people? (laughs) Do you like Bridgerton that much? (laughs) We already talked about Crackle, David. (laughs) <laughs> People are just missing the forest for the trees. It's infuriating. Hallmark is creating a new streaming service. Okay, that's just a blatant lie on my part, but I can't help it. I'm so excited. The horrifically named Hallmark Movies Now will switch to Hallmark Plus in mid-September, just in time for my birthday, by the way. What do fans get with the new Hallmark Plus? I know you're wondering. Don't tell me you're not. Well, they get to pay more as the new service costs $7.99 a month or $79.99 annually, as opposed to $5.99 a month or $59.99 annually. For your extra money, you get a $5 Hallmark Gold Crown Store coupon monthly, uh, free unlimited e-cards, which are apparently still a thing. Oh, oh, and a Lacey Chabert reality series. Now we're talking. That's actually the plan here. They're going to wall off some exclusive content to get current cable customers to try this streaming thingy the grandkids won't shut up about. Seriously, it sounds just like a lazy rebrand to sell the same thing at a higher price. But Hallmark Channel, what price could you put on love, people? Let the record Uh, show nobody else on the podcast had any idea I was going to do that. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm actually quite curious as to how this impacts Hallmark's agreement with Peacock. I should look up to see when Hallmark made that deal with Peacock. These deals usually last a year or two years. And so I wonder if the launch of Hallmark Plus coincides with the anniversary of the uh, Peacock deal. The one thing I noticed is they're not making any promise to integrate the new content, which means the stuff that debuts on cable. So it sounds like just another way to get the same customers to pay a higher price. I'd like to be more optimistic about it, but this one seemed pretty cynical. I mean, e-cards? Really? Anyway, I guess we can talk about box office since you all don't love Hallmark Channel. Yeah, let's go for it, Tim. Okay, because I feel like we have an interesting box office story this weekend, and it's not that Despicably Me 4 is, again, the top movie. Uh, We had two new releases. One had a reported budget of $100 million, ye ye gods, and one cost, uh, well, under $10 million. I mean, I've seen anywhere from $3 to $10 million, nothing definite. Which one made more money at the box office on Friday? The shot in the dark, but I'm going to guess the one that costs less. Yeah, yeah. It's the cheap horror film. That would be Long Legs, which came out of nowhere to make $10 million on Friday. Whatever its budget is, that made it back in one day. And what was the one with the $100 million budget? That would be Fly Me to the Moon, starring Channing Tatum and Scarlett Johansson. And that made $4.4 million on Friday. Swear to God, I thought that was going to streaming. That is basically my point. Apparently, Apple footed most of the bill for this one. It was released by Sony, but this is not the type of movie that people are going to go see in theaters anymore. And movie theaters need to realize that. Yeah, Apple's track record in terms of these releases is not good with movies like Napoleon and Argyle. They're just not meeting expectations, despite the fact that they have, honestly, A-list talent in front and behind the cameras. These movies just are not clicking with audiences. This is the latest example of something that people would have sworn, oh, they should have released that in theaters. And when they did, no one cared enough to go. The people making these decisions have very detailed evaluations of demographics. And it's an instance where if you're saying, hey, I know what's better than them, you're one being egotistical and generally speaking two, you're just being dead wrong. We've known all along that when Apple made the decision that they were going to push this on Sony, that something like this was going to happen. It's not that kind of film. It's a Greg Berlanti film. And Greg Berlanti is the guy who did all of these superhero shows on the CW. I mean, he has a niche audience. It's very, very loyal. But even with this, he's moved away from it. There was no reason to believe this was going to be a box office hit. Long Legs, on the other hand, that's a pretty interesting story, isn't it, Tim? And just latest demonstration, cheap horror is really where the same safest play is. Oh yeah, absolutely. And this is a neon film and this is going to be one of their, well, easily their biggest opening weekend ever. I mean, they are, I mean, if you look at their list of movies, their biggest grosser ever is Parasite. And that's only because it, you know, won all those Oscars. This is immediately going to be one of their biggest movies ever. It costs nothing. And yeah, this is the one thing we've been consistent in box office for the last 20 plus years is yeah, dirt cheap horror movies are almost always going to be winners. This is impressive. Just 10 million out of nowhere. I mean, it's going to be, you know, 22, 23 million for the weekend, but that's all just found money. And we do have another bit of theatrical news, I suppose, this week. And how to frame this tactfully? Um, We have one fewer theatrical movie release in August. Yeah, Horizon, coincidentally enough, made 720000 on Friday, so it's looking at a $2 million weekend. Everybody involved with this has looked at the situation and gone, let's be honest, we got to punt. We got to hope that we pick up a new audience on streaming for this. There is no point in releasing the second film in six weeks, which, oh, by the way, we've been saying for six months now. So the fact that they didn't see this kind of goes against my argument earlier that you're not smarter than studio executives. Maybe you can be sometimes. But here we are, and Roel, I know that you were just laughing and laughing about this. Everything about this is funny, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know how much I was laughing. I mean, it's it was comical to think that you can release a movie and schedule its sequel for just a couple of months after, counting on the fact that you're going to carry over that audience. You've literally created a series, and you think you're going to be able to make it work theatrically when right now there just isn't that kind of audience going to theaters. I think there is a path forward for Kevin Costner and his Horizon saga. Let's be clear, chapter two has been filmed. Uh, Apparently he's filming chapter three as we speak. 
speak. And their goal is to build an audience, presumably with DVD and Blu-ray releases, although not at Redbox, and <laughs> then hopefully carry that over. Now, that would have been, what do we call that? The Austin Powers model? But it's silly to think that that's going to work. I see a path forward, and that is maybe the Christian theatrical circuit. We have seen successful movies that have made money that way, and I think there is a considerable overlap for that audience and the audience that Kevin Costner is looking for with this movie. But he sunk a lot of money into this franchise, and I don't know that he's ever going to recover any of it. There are streaming services that might work for him. Heck, Hallmark Channel has a streaming service now. Maybe that's the place to go. <laughs> the one thing I'll say here, and I mean this sincerely, if you are in any way involved with the production of the third Horizons film, get paid in advance. Don't accept checks. <laughs> And make sure the money clears. I mean, make absolute sure, because this is a bankruptcy disaster waiting to happen. You'd think it was a chicken soup for the soul production. I'm trying not to laugh here. I really am, because a lot of people are getting caught in the, the wash right now. But this is a big deal. And I do want to add, there's one other box office story of note, and that is the sustained success of Inside Out 2. Inside Out 2 recently passed The Incredibles 2 to become the most successful Pixar film ever. And by the end of the weekend, it's going to pass. 1.3 billion and at that point it's actually going to earn more than Frozen it will become one of the three most successful animated films of all time it appears inevitable it's going to beat the Super Mario Brothers movie and it's got a really good chance at the current champion which is Frozen 2 so more and more success for Inside Out 2 Tim, that should be a pretty nice lead in toward the Nielsen charts. Yeah. So thanks to, well, mostly thanks to Variety, but Nielsen eventually got their stuff together. So we are going to quickly go through two weeks of ratings. The first being the ones we should have had last week, which is Monday, June 3rd to Sunday, June 9th, 2024. Your top original show that debuted last week is Eric, of course, uh, 926 million minutes viewed for its six episode season. I'm shocked. I did not think the series would have that kind of momentum. Yeah, it's a little surprising considering just the premise and what it, what it's about. It just seems also kind of kind of dark, but I guess that was good enough. Sub 1 billion. Usually we've had multiple shows crack a billion on originals and just wait for the next week's ratings. But yeah, good enough. So I have no other explanation for it other than that. It's, what the hell is this about? And we'll watch it. I don't know. Uh, returning in second is Sweet Tooth, 874 million minutes for 24 episodes. The final season of this show arrived during this ratings week, and we've seen it before with each previous season. And actually, just a three-day number, it premiered on June 6th, so we will definitely see it again on the following week's ratings for the full week. Bridgerton temporarily drops to two-third, 806 million minutes for 20 episodes. Just wait for, for the next week's ratings. The second half of the third season will arrive for that chart. Evil from Netflix and Paramount+. Plus. 39 episodes, 524 million minutes. That's been here for a while now. New in fifth is Geek Girl from Netflix, of course. 515 million minutes for 10 episodes. This series debuted on May 30th. So it's, it's the full week of ratings for it. So that's why we didn't see it before and won't see it again. In six, Dancing for the Devil, the 7M, not 7 million, TikTok cult, 489 million minutes, three episode docuseries. But in here's new in seventh, The Acolyte from Disney Plus, 488 million minutes for two episodes. This is the latest Star Wars adjacent series premiering on June 4th with its first two episodes and then releasing weekly from here. That strikes me as fairly typical Star Wars on Disney Plus, does it you? Yeah, we will see it again next week. It is going to ha hang around probably for the course of its season, but I just feel like this one hasn't had the buzz. I mean, they're not all going to be the Mandalorian. It does feel like diminishing returns for all, all the spinoffs for the extended Star Wars series universe on Disney+, Plus. but I, given the reaction to this one, I am kind of surprised that we actually are, are seeing it, to be honest. I'm not, but the only reason why is Disney actually did one of their press releases indicating its popularity, so they were very, very comfortable with it. We'll see another one in a couple of weeks with the bear they were mm -hmm. kind of even with one another in terms of the press release oh wow okay so i mean i expect the bear to be absolutely huge when that when we get those numbers but it does account for the fact that it's on hulu instead of netflix so we'll see not that we've not seen a hulu show top the charts before but it will be on yeah i'm not as optimistic about it as you are i think it'll be right in line with this um i think it's a 500 million minute show if it gets more than that that's excellent because that will already be representative of growing the brand by 20 percent or so so you know if it's better than that wow Okay. I just feel like it's gained all this momentum over the last year or so. 
that's something I'm looking forward to over the next few weeks. Eighth, the docuseries, something about, you know, Hitler and the Nazis, whatever, 443 million minutes, six episodes. Returning in ninth, Perfect Match from Netflix, 95 million minutes, 18 total episodes. The second season of the, uh, as I like to call it, the Avengers Endgame of reality dating shows from Netflix arrived on June 7th with six new episodes and then three more on the 14th and a finale on the 21st of June. But we do wrap up originals with the Paramount Plus show, Mayor of Kingstown, 22 episodes, 306 million minutes. The third season of this show, wow, three seasons of Paramount Plus, premiered on June 2nd. So then it added episodes weekly. So here we are seeing it after just two episodes into the season. So good for Paramount Plus for sneaking on the chart there. Movies led by, no surprise here, Hitman, 984 million minutes after premiering on the 6th. That's a big number just for three days. And spoiler, it grows for the full week, which is very impressive. So this is a big winner for Netflix. Yeah, not bad. It was pretty buzzy when it came out. There was a lot of love for lead actor, his name is Escapes me <laughs> for lead actor Glenn Powell, who seems to be really coming into his own, having been in that Sydney Swinney movie, Anyone But You, and yes. is headlining Twisters later this summer. Yes, he's everywhere right now, and we still have to Google his name <laughs> <laughs> to remember who, who he was. Generic white guy. <laughs> Uh, but also new in second, there's Under Paris, 636 million minutes for uh, the shark in the Paris sewers or river movie. Em was right and I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Told Kim you. was Kim was excited about this one. That yeah, this is going to make the ratings. <laughs> uh, but also new in third, hey, Godzilla minus one, five hundred twenty nine million minutes after showing up on Netflix, and also basically everywhere else too. Like you could just go ahead and buy it or rent it on demand too. But it was also on Netflix, and we knew it would be here, even though it got no advance notice. But that's actually pretty impressive. But uh, it actually disappears after this week. But that was a surprisingly good start. Yeah, it had a very unusual surprise release on streaming where I think it was just the day before all streaming services were mentioning how it was coming to streaming, including on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And I guess it had a little bit of a bump from all that, but I have to believe that if they had just marketed it a little bit more beforehand, that maybe it would have done a little bit better. To be fair, this was actually the full week. It did show up on June 1st with no notice, which is just also very weird for Netflix. So it is a full week of ratings, but I'm actually surprised it didn't stick around beyond that. The Lego movie from Netflix, they're in 42 million minutes. Sure, whatever. But this one's not a surprise. Inside Out from Disney Plus, 282 million minutes because, hey, what came out uh, in a couple days from this chart? Inside Out 2, of course. Yeah, I'll go ahead and spoil the other number as well. For the next week, it was 613 million minutes. Mm -hmm. By my calculations, almost exactly 10 million people rewatched this on Disney Plus in anticipation of Inside Out 2, which is exactly what Disney and Pixar want to see. I mean, exactly. This has been best case scenario all the way around. Yeah, I did want to point out that while it actually has is now the biggest Pixar movie worldwide, Inside Out 2 has not quite passed Incredibles 2 for the domestic title, but that's just a matter of time. Right. That is 600, uh, 608 million, but Inside Out 2 will get there in a few more weeks. I actually wrote a box office column yesterday, and I realized how hard it is explaining to people who don't follow box office the difference between global and domestic. And as a reminder, at box office profits, we always stress the global stuff, that's kind of noise. Domestic, that's what matters the most. So that is an important distinction right there. Yeah, it began to have a bigger impact in the last few years, especially when China emerged as a big box office country, which is why we were getting ridiculous sequels like Transformers movies and 57 Fast and Furious movies, because they were just ridiculous overseas, even if there was diminishing returns domestically. But yeah, the domestic is always the more important number. Yeah, that was 100% Hollywood capitalizing on the fact that the bigger number sounds better. The late Howard J. Epstein actually did a calculation that showed that in terms of Chinese box office, American companies got back about 8% of that gross. That's not a typo. I don't mean 18 or 80. <laughs> I mean, less than 10%. One out of every $12 comes back to the United States. So that's why I have always looked at Chinese box office like, sure, why not? That is monopoly money. But again, you want to market a film as making $1.3 not $600 million. So, you know. 
Anyway, Moana is now the second biggest film on, on Disney Plus for a couple of weeks, 277 million minutes and six. Atlas from Netflix after a couple weeks at the top, 264 million minutes. Home from 2015 showed up on Netflix on June 1st, 250 million minutes. 300 Rise, Known Empire, same deal, 219 million minutes. And Dune Part 2 from Max wraps up movies, 216 million minutes. Acquired is 10 shows we've seen before, led by the show that showed up last week, Your Honor, exploding to 1.5 billion minutes for 20 total episodes after coming to Netflix on May 31st. What the hell? Just just absurd because the series sure. has been on Paramount Plus forever and people just weren't watching it. Or, you know, maybe Nielsen just wasn't measuring it properly. <laughs> Yeah, true. But what? Really? Come on. Okay. You know, Blue, uh, Blue Eager is Anatomy, also over a billion minutes in second and third. There is one returning show I'll throw out in, in fourth, Heartland, credited to Hulu, Netflix, and Peacock. 924 million minutes for 251 episodes. This is a Canadian show that's been on apparently forever. And the 16th of 17 seasons showed up on Netflix on June 1st. <laughs> I remember when this one showed up on the ratings for the first time and Reagan was able to explain it to us all with <laughs> these two words, horse girls. <laughs> yeah, it is a very long running Canadian series. Yes. Anyway, uh, on to the latest week of ratings. So we'll look at Monday, June 10th to Sunday, June 16th, 2024. And no surprise, returning to the top, Bridgerton, 3.4 billion minutes for 24 episodes as the second half of the third season arrived on June 13th. Clearly, some people just waited for the whole thing to drop or just decided to help rewatch those first four episodes again. Hold on, Tim, I wasn't listening. If you can repeat those numbers for me while I sip this glass of water. Oh, sure. Bridgerton, 3.4 billion minutes. <laughs> 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 Didn't someone on this podcast say it was a dying brand? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, come on. Just wow. Did they wait for the whole thing or did they just go ahead and rewatch those first four again? Probably a little bit of both. But by God, this is three billion minutes for the show. I really thought, not that it was dying, but I just thought it didn't keep up the momentum after that first season, even though second was big. But I just figured that people, they were over at this point. But no, they they want their uh, their modest rippers. Returning in second is The Boys. 1.2 billion minutes for 30 episodes on Prime Video. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would get you number one most any other week. Yeah, it would. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, the first three episodes of the fourth season arrived on June 13th, and then it's weekly from here. The first season did drop all at once way back in 2019, so actually prior to the podcast. But for the last three, they've dropped the first three episodes at once and then go weekly from there. And I think that pays off for them. Uh, Sweet Tooth from Netflix, still here, 971 million minutes. So a slight jump from the last week for the first full week of its third and final season. Same thing happens with Perfect Match from Netflix, 802 million minutes. Wow. For 21 episodes, adding three more episodes on the 14th and then one more to go. So it'll probably hang around just another week before you know the inevitable third season comes. Evil from Paramount Plus and Netflix, of course, 449 million, 40 episodes. Mostly the things we've seen before. The Acolyte does add an episode, 370 million minutes. Eric drops to 367 million minutes after its week at the top. Some terrible, you know, docu series is a three hundred fourteen million minutes. Mayor of Kingstown does hang around twenty three episodes, two hundred ninety eight million minutes, and returning in tenth, Futurama two hundred forty one million minutes for one hundred fifty three episodes from Hulu. Boom! How is Futurama an original? We did this before. That's new episodes. <laughs> they have new episodes Let's combined yes, with old episodes. Was, yes, new yeah. episodes combined with old episodes. Episode, yes. But they, I mean, they will have new episodes coming in a few weeks, too. It's just a reflection of <laughs> Nielsen's inability to actually segregate which shows are playing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't know. In fact, that is exactly why Big Bang Theory keeps showing up on the acquireds list because they are literally measuring you watching Big Bang Theory on CBS uh, or TBS. And, yeah. <laughs> or TBS on broadcast television and lumping it in with streaming ratings because the mechanism is not intelligent enough to know the difference. And so they say, it's probably Paramount Plus. It does do really well on TBS, TNT, whichever one of them it's airing on. So here's the idea, and I think you might agree, but when you look at the acquired charts and how we've seen once once Nielsen figured out whatever the hell is happening and Bob's Burgers and Family Guy started showing up on the card chart, are like three times as many people really watching those shows as opposed to Futurama? Is it that niche? I find it hard to believe that that or The Simpsons isn't always, yes, right. you know, on the chart. Right. Where the hell's The Simpsons, except for like during October? 
But yeah, uh, it's th- things we'll never have the answer to until, you know, Nielsen decides to just, you know, put us in charge. Anyway, movies for this week was still led by Hitman up to one billion minutes. So uh, so an increase for the first full week. And that that's a very good sign. Uh, I think we said, decided his name was Glenn Powell. So, yeah, he's he's everywhere right now. He's the, the hot new thing. And this movie is actually very well received. So that does help a lot. David mentioned when we talked about the previous chart that yeah, Inside Out took a big jump, 613 million minutes to be second, because this was the week that Inside Out 2 arrived. So no surprise there. Under Paris, still here, 482 million minutes. And something new in fourth, Wonder, 430 million minutes. Oh, good. It's not a new movie. Yeah, no, this was the uh, Owen Wilson, Julia Roberts movie from 2017. Uh, that, of course, you know, came to Netflix on June 8th for who knows what reason. Really? Come on. Whatever. Home arrived on last week's chart. It came back to Netflix, 319 million minutes. Bratz, 244 million minutes. Oh, yeah, this is the uh, the Brat Pack documentary. Thankfully, they put 2024. I would have, would have had to assume it was, you know, one of those you know, stupid doll things. No, Tim, that's spelled with a Z. Oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, this is actually from Hulu, 244 million minutes. So, yeah, hey, a Hulu, Solid. A, a Hulu movie. Yeah. Yep. Shocking. Sure, a lot of Gen Xers were yeah. tuning in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Moana, 236 million minutes. The Super Mario Brothers movie, 210 million minutes. Ultraman Rising, 187 million minutes from Netflix. This is new too. Okay, this is a 2024 animated release that arrived on the 14th. And movies wraps up with the Lego movie, 179 million minutes. Of course, returning to Netflix from the void at the start of the month. This week's acquired is 10 shows we have seen before, still led by Your Honor. Another 1.9 billion minutes. Come on, people. 20 episodes. The show was on Showtime. It was on Paramount Plus. What the? Yeah, well, you know, <sighs> it was, there's another season of Suits coming to Netflix. Yeah, soon. I know. That's coming back. Enough. That's coming back. We forgot to mention that Lost is going to probably be the top show when we get turned the calendar to July on these ratings because that showed up uh, on Netflix on July 1st. We do have a returning show in 8th, and that is House of the Dragon from Max, 741 million minutes for 11 11 episodes. So I guess that does just count the first episode because we had a question about this during the first season because these ratings end on Sunday, but the new episodes of House of Dragon arrive on Sunday. So when exactly do they count? And looks like enough people checked it out during the premiere that it crept back onto the acquired chart. So actually, maybe they'll be the top show next week when it asks people watch the, the first episode and then some of them watch the second. And that was two weeks of ratings. So yeah, I remember watch Bridgerton and then that Brian Cranston show and then Hitman over the last two weeks. That's about it. Welcome to summer, I guess. I guess. At least Hitman's good. Yep. All right. Well, as always, we close out the show with what's been keeping us busy over the last week. And David and I watched quite a few things. We did wrap up Clipped, which I will jokingly call that Clippers show, but it (laughs) is not nearly as good as that Lakers show, which was realistically called winning time. It was good. I mean, it was fine, but it was a lot more, I don't know, sorted. Winning Time did a really nice job of portraying management, players, all the people involved. I mean, I don't know how they managed to get such perfect people to play the players, but they did. Clipped, it's fine. Like, it's fine. I guess that's how I'll describe it. I don't necessarily recommend it. I'm glad we watched it, if only to say I can compare it to that Lakers show and confirm that that Lakers show is by far superior and really did deserve another season. Raul, how about you? This week, I watched Good Omens season two on Prime Video. It was a short and sweet season, only six episodes. It was nice to finally watch a show where the fate of the entire universe doesn't hang in the balance until, of course, it turns out to be exactly the stakes once again. The the season starts innocently enough with the Archangel Gabriel, played by John Hamm, showing up at the door of Azarafel's bookstore, buck naked and with no memory of who he is. Azarafel and Crowley, played by Michael Sheen and David Tennant, then get to work untangling the mystery of what's happened to Gabriel as the forces of both heaven and hell begin to take a considerable interest in getting their hands on the Archangel. A good portion of the season is spent exploring the backstory of both Azarafel and Crowley, how they came to meet and and how they both influenced each other in their falls. The mystery wraps up in a nice and tidy conclusion. There's a delightful yet brief sequence of two people falling in love set to the music of Buddy Holly's Every Day, which is going to stick with me for a very long time. And a 
painfully heartbreaking scene at the end, which begs for season three, which mercifully is on its way. Production wise, it's clear that the budget was scaled back dramatically for season two. It doesn't have the scope or grandeur of season one, but that doesn't take away anything from this season. Although given what they seem to have in mind for season three, I expect they've probably held back some money and reserved the budget for season three. Ultimately, season two is very sweet and in places rather bittersweet. David Tennant as the demon Crowley is clearly having the time of his life and remains the best part of any show he's in. If you enjoyed Good Omens season one, I strongly recommend season two, although I suspect a lot of people didn't realize that there was a season two. And get ready because there is a season three on the way. All right, Tim, how about you? Two quick things. I've said it before, but you should just be watching wrestling right now, whether it's AEW or WWE, all of it's great. You'll figure out what you like and just watch that. Could be both, could be one or the other. Even NXT is good right now. They had their event on Sunday after Saturday's Money in the Bank, which was fine, but we're in an era where we're fine isn't isn't good enough. Pay-per-views need to be great. And WWE has been great. AEW has been great. I liked NXT's Heat Wave better, actually, than Money in the Bank. And then, you know, you got AEW where over the course of like oh, the last nine months, they told the story of All About Eve. And that was just one of the most <laughs> amazing things that they've done. And then they the, sure did the, the brutal, just the absolute. I mean, we knew it was coming at some point or maybe people thought that, oh, it's going to be Tony Storm pulling the trigger. But no, it, it, <laughs> it was Mariah May, just a brutal just turn on her. Oh, my God. That was impressive. I applaud everyone everyone involved. The crowd just immediately went from loving her to wanting to see Tony Storm just murder her in the matter of like 30 seconds. It's all good right now. Figure out what you like and watch it. On the Steam sale, which ended this past week, I didn't pick up too much. I bought two games I haven't started yet that I've wanted to for a while, though. One was Horizon Zero Dawn, which we actually brought up last week when the potential series adaptation probably won't be going forward because the guy got canceled. Mm. Uh, And then something else called Detroit Become Human that came out a few years ago that was supposed to be very narrative story driven. And I've always heard good things about also played something called death must die which is an early access game and it's kind of like a combination of hades and vampire survivors but also not as good as either of those games it still has a work in progress but it is one of those games where now vampire survivors has knockoffs where you're in the middle and you just have swarms of enemies coming at you and you have various weapons and abilities all that but this one mixes in different buffs and blessings from god characters similar to what hades does and also has gear and equipment to like you buff your stats for future runs it's got potential it's like super cheap right now even not on sale it's seven bucks regular price i think i bought it for like three so it was worth it for that but i'll keep watching to see how they evolve that one in the future yeah i'm looking forward to diving into those other games at some point when i finally have time all right thanks tim and david how about you yeah i'm with kim clip was just a huge disappointment i mean there's no getting around it at one point we looked at each other and we were agreeing it's tragic that the lakers show got canceled and yet we're getting clipped instead because it is just the cheap generic knockoff in all ways on the plus side we did watch a film called a family affair that i fully intended to make fun of the whole time through and yet it turned out to be quite charming with a surprisingly sharp script um it did it was fun it was i get the feeling nicole kidman only did it because she probably had a teen dollar at the time who watched those stupid high school musical movies and this was her way to taunt her and say hey Hey, I've done a romance with Zac Efron. And then Zac Efron did it because he probably grew up with eyes wide shut. So, you know, the casting makes sense, but uh, the film itself is surprisingly charming. And I also watched God Help Me, The Beekeeper. And I always think whenever I do these of how disposable they are, that was pretty much The Beekeeper whose script was so stupid, it hurt my soul. And I've seen Crank and Crank 2. So that kind of should calibrate for you just how bad this one was. Overall, it just wasn't the best week. We also have a bone to pick with Raul because he mentioned Rick and Morty. And so because of a clip he showed, we went and watched the pilot episode of Rick and Morty. And I'm just scarred for life. Uh, I don't know what that was. Kemp's pretty insistent that we never go back. I'm on the fence about it because I have seen some clips of the show that are pretty funny. But uh, that pilot is not for everyone. It is divisive. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, yeah, no. Be prepared. Rick and Morty is very nihilistic. It's for people who basically hate life. (laughs) Ha <laughs> 
And me, I'm counting down the days till Harmart Plus. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for listening to Streaming Into the Void. Please consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. And we welcome your feedback. Remember that we're on social media at Streaming Void and online at StreamingVoid.com. If you like what you're hearing, please consider becoming a supporter on Patreon at Patreon.com slash Streaming Void. Be sure to watch for us again next week. <laughs>